those breakout discussions went well. I very much enjoyed the conversation. Um, I guess we're probably going to get folks trickling back in. Um, final panel of the day before our event uh, uh, is on platform data and the information ecosystem, and it's a presentation of our special issue of UCLA Journal of Law and Technology on regulating journalism and news media sustainability. And we have all three of our authors here. Uh, Maria Luisa Stasi is a graduate candidate at Tilburg University, as well as head of law and policy for digital markets for Article 19, one of the world's leading free speech organizations. Courtney Raj is a resident fellow here at the UCLA Institute of Technology, Law and Policy, who uh, has been involved in all of our pro uh, programming and developing this, this, this conference as well. Um, and she also uh, authored uh, one of the articles. Prior to her arrival at uh, UCLA, she served as director of advocacy and communications for the Committee to Protect Journalists in addition to her positions with UNESCO and Freedom House. Uh, and Frank Lamonte is uh, counsel at CNN, as well as a lawyer with an extensive track record of advocacy and support of press freedom and the right to information, including with the Breckner Center for Freedom of Information. Uh, moderators are Ariana Wilner, the editor-in-chief of the UCLA Journal of Law Technology, and Nathan Siegel, co-executive editor of the UCLA Journal of Law Technology. I will pass it over to our moderators. Thank you, everyone. I'm Ariana. Uh, I'm Nathan. And we just wanted to start off um, by welcoming our authors. We're so excited to be publishing your pieces. Um, and we wanted to invite each of you to introduce your pieces um, and what you feel is at stake regarding the state of journalism and news media, media and how your proposed solution uh, proposals address these issues. So we can start off with Frank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hate being first. Okay, sure. <laughs> thank you. And really, thank you for the opportunity to, in my day job, um, decisions are flying at you at the speed of light. And so the opportunity to actually just sit and think for a day is such a rarity and such a luxury and such a treat. So thank you for that. Um, I will start with the disclaimer that I, I am not speaking on behalf of my employer. I, I, I actually have my own. Um, my University of Florida researcher hat on, and this is the capacity in which I started this paper, which it took us uh, 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 long enough to complete that I changed jobs in the course of the paper. <laughs> but um, I, I, I did a piece with two of my um, my research assistants at the University of Florida Director Center about the, the phenomenon of, of government-run open data portals. We sort of took the, uh, the prompt, the invitation about platforms and journalism in a very different direction, talking about the platformization of, of information by government agencies and looking at both the, the promise of this, the possibility that um, governments affirmatively producing data and documents online could sort of help supplement the well-documented deficit in news coverage that you've been hearing about throughout the day, but also the downsides of relying on government-produced information in the absence of those learned intermediaries to act as sort of data surplus for us and data validators, right? And so both the, the promise and the, the, the problems of open data portals is the subject of our paper. Um, it, it is, I, know, I hope we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about I, I, uh, the subject that I've seen woven throughout a number of these uh, discussions about government subsidization of news, right? That's like one of the topics that seems to be recurring in a lot of our conversations, including the breakout that I was just in. <coughs> and from my vantage point, it is very funny Think about the idea that the government might actually be a financial benefactor to news because from my vantage point government is constantly finding ways to make gathering and publishing news more difficult and more costly and so my sort of first recommendation for uh, uh, could government financially subsidize and support news yes they could by just getting out of the way by stopping affirmatively thwarting and frustrating access to the data that rightfully belongs to the public. And so uh, uh, this uh, concept of, for those who haven't used this, right, all 50 states now, many, many municipalities have these open data portals. Um, sometimes they're referred to as like open checkbook sites. Um, we really saw these explode during the COVID-19 pandemic, these data dashboards, right, where rather than um, the old model, which was a, a poll-based model, right? For a long time, a poll-based model for access to information for government. That is, 
Do you file a FOIA request? You file a Freedom of Information request. Can you drag the records out of the government, oftentimes at great expense and consumption of time, and with incomplete and frustrating results? Instead of that whole model, open data embraces a, a push model that government agencies will affirmatively publish their highest value data sets online so that the press and everybody else, advocates, members of the public, concerned citizens, researchers, can all benefit from free and timely access to this, taking that friction of FOIA out of the transaction, right? That's the, the promise, that's the possibility. Um, but uh, there are many shortcomings in relying on these portals as sort of a, a, a substitute for journalism, and they have to be thought of as a supplement instead, a supplement, maybe a, a force multiplier, the term we sometimes use in the paper, that it could be a tool that, that augments journalism by, by making it easier for journalists to get their hands on data that they used to have to extract from government agencies uh, uh, at, under, under great uh, uh, time and, and uh, money consumption, right? And one of the one of the many shortcomings of, of, of both public records laws and FOIA laws and open data laws is that while we do a pretty good job of requiring government agencies to produce the records that they already have or the data that they already have, we do a very poor job of requiring them to actually gather the data in the first place. And so um, they do quite a terrible job of, of actually counting things keeping track of them and, and, and putting them into a sort of an apples to apples format so that you could say, right, is uh, police brutality in New Jersey going up or going down or staying the same, right? Well, we should know the answer to that question. That's something that should be counted, right? But it's not reliably counted. And so while the law does a good job of requiring agencies to produce the information that they already have, it doesn't do a very good job at all of requiring to actually ask these really basic and obvious questions. Um, I will put in a short plug for, we started a podcast during my time at the UF Rector Center, it's called Why Don't We Know? Um, and Why Don't We Know is all about this, it's all about identifying these kind of holes in the civic data safety net. And, and one of my favorite anecdotes of the podcast experience, just to show you how bad government is at collecting and gathering and pushing out data, uh, we, we thought, well, an interesting data point would be, um, let's look at concussions in college sports, right? This is a, a data point that you would think any responsible college athletic department in the 21st century would be tracking, right? Are, are concussions getting better or worse? Are the same? We're doing a good job of stopping people from suffering brain injuries during sports or not, right? Of course we want to know that. Of course we need to know that. And um, most of the universities that we, uh, that we surveyed for that data point said that they did not keep track of it, they did not keep count of it, including, notably, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, which is home to a national research center on head injuries and sports, and where the president of the university is the nation's most renowned concussion physician. They do not count how many times their own athletes suffer traumatic brain injury. They just don't ask the question. And so uh, uh, this is one of the many kind of shortcomings in the first generation of the open data movement, right, is that there's not a legal compulsion to actually gather high value data sets and to report them out in an apples to apples way that would enable members of the public to make meaningful comparisons to be able to say, are things getting better? Are things getting worse? Are they staying the same? Is our state better or our city better or worse than, than, than others? Um, we did a little um, experiment, a mini experiment uh, with researchers at the Breckner Center looking at, uh, we figured, well, in the 21st century, what's sort of the highest value data set that you could think of that anybody would want from a city government? And we immediately settled on uh, use of force by police, right? I mean, of course, of course, everybody has to be counting and tracking, right? I mean, you couldn't responsibly say, you don't know how often officers draw their guns on people, or how often you receive a complaint of, of excessive force by the public, right? Of course we want to know that, of course we need to know that. And we picked out 10 uh, uh, large cities, 10 medium-sized cities, and 10 small cities, and looked at their open data portal. Could I answer that question as a concerned citizen? Could I find out whether uh, uh, police are using force more often, less often, or the same? Are they using weapons? Are they receiving complaints? And what we found sort of intuitively validates what you might suspect, which is that <clears throat> the bigger the city, the more likely they were to have at least some of that information online. New York's was very good. It had all three of those data points. Uh, uh, San Antonio's was very good. It had all three of those data points. But the vast majority had, had, had either an incomplete set or actually in the case of the 10 small cities, none at all. And none of the 10 small cities didn't find any data points 
about police use of force on their open data fields. And so this is one of the kind of foundational shortcomings that's been identified by researchers that we build on, which is that um, government agencies have been kind of just shoveling their data onto these open data portals based on what is it that we actually have in inventory, right, as opposed to kind of prioritizing things that people most want to know. And so it's a granny's attic right now when you go into the open data portal and, you know, here's some, you know, moose antlers and here's a box of videotapes and uh, here's some old record albums, right, as opposed to, like, did we actually gather, prioritize, um, and do quality control? over the highest value pieces of data that people might find most useful. Um, and uh, I'm just going to kind of speed ahead to the, to the end here. We, we, we do find some, uh, uh, some, some bright spots, particularly New York journalists have really been successful at, at harnessing the New York Open Data Portal, which is a pretty good one, um, to tell good stories, to use as that force multiplier. And so uh, uh, things like uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there's a blog called uh, Street Blog that's been really uh, uh, harnessing the open data from New York to do things like telling people, well, here's where you're most likely to get a ticket from an automated red light camera, right? It's a very useful piece of data that you can imagine the people engaging with and wanting to see, oh, you know, here are the intersections that are I'm most likely to get a ticket if I speed through a red light. Um, so that's really news you can use, right? Um, um, there's one particular one um, that we really loved as an example because it shows how a person who would never ever have been able to manually gather all this data by themselves was able to use open data in a very societally productive way. A guy who's a, a statistician who has a blog called I Quant New York, I Quant New York, um, um, found out that, that because he got a ticket himself for parking his car in a place where it was legal for his parking car, he found that the NYPD had been misinterpreting a, a, a parking statute and had misinterpreted it against him. And he wanted to know how many other times people got cited for parking in the same type of a zone where it was perfectly legal to do so. And he was able to document using the open data portal that, oh, $1.7 million a year worth of tickets are being issued for violating this code section, which is actually not against the law. Um, and so he was able to use the open data to, to, to bring about change, to bring this to the attention of MIPD that said, oh, you know what, you're actually right. We're going to stop writing those tickets, and we're going to do spot checking on our cops from uh, henceforth to see if they're, if, they're, if they're continuing to issue these tickets. So right, real success story shows you the power of this platform if the data is actually prioritized in a way that addresses concerns that, that, that people will, will use. Um, there are uh, many, many downsides to the, the open data movement and the sort of reliance on open data as a substitute and not a, as an augment to FOIA. One of those that we flag in the paper is what we do not want is for government agencies to stop actually fulfilling FOIAs and just doing the sort of IKEA thing and saying, well, here, we'll point you to the open data portal and you can build your own answer, right? Here's some dowels and here's, a, here, here, here's, here's some, uh, uh, some, some fiber board and you can build your own FOIA answer, right? We don't want that. If you FOIA records from a government agency, by golly, you should get back records. You shouldn't get back just that here's a link to an open data portal. Go dig around and find it for yourself among the 300 different data sets. So, uh, uh, these things should exist as complements to each other. And actually, we suggest that, and there's some data from Sunlight Foundation showing this, that government agencies can use this as a cost saver, right? They can use FOIA requests to figure out how to prioritize, oh, well, we're getting 16 FOIA requests a month for the police use of force. That tells us this is a data set we should be affirmatively publishing because lots of people are asking for it over and over again. This, by nature, is a high value data set. And guess what? We can save ourselves the cost of processing the 16 points a month if we just push it out online. Um, last point on that, you know, I, I, I definitely think that, um, that in order for this data to, to, to have real city value, it has to be auditable and it has to be audited, right? There has to be kind of like what your high school geometry teacher told you, show your work, right? Uh, uh, government agencies can't just push out their conclusions. They have to actually make the underlying data auditable so that, and we suggest that, you know, in the same way government finance is spot checked by auditors, government data should be spot checked by auditors as well, so that if they're putting garbage data out online, it will get caught. But ultimately, that's an interesting new role for journalists as well, right? To be sort of civic fact checkers, uh, to be going back and auditing this data, and it should be part of what sort of uh, journalists uh, uh, work into. Their, uh, their, their plan of work, right, to, uh, to, to fact check government data so that we're not on the honor system. Thank you.
I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Courtney. Great. Um, thanks so much. Nice to be here. I wrote a paper about platformization and media capture, very much along the lines of the issues that we've been discussing throughout this conference and um, building on a report that I did for the Center for International Media Assistance called Making Big Tech Pay for the News They Use. And so it's what I did in this article is to look at the different proposals that are being proposed around the world um, to assess both the type of policy interventions that they're proposing, um, but also to put them in the context of this broader concern and, and consideration about media capture. Um, and media, and not just media capture, but also like other forms of capture. So when we talk about media capture in the field of press freedom or you know, media sustainability, it's oftentimes about government intervention, but it can also be about the private sector and it's more recently about platformization, which is the potential for capture by platforms. And so I look at kind of three broad categories in this paper. One is taxation and subsidies through taxes. So that's very much a government type of intervention. Another one is copyright and licensing, which is again, it's a type of government intervention, but it's more about shaping the legal regulatory environment rather than directly kind of this direct relationship or monetary relationship with the platform, uh, with, the, with the media outlets. And then looking at competition and antitrust, which again is about shaping the environment in which the media work uh, with, with respect to, especially the tech, tech platforms. And so what I'm really interested in, A, is looking at the theory of change that's driving these different interventions, right? So if you're the EU and you pass the copyright directive that gives news media publishers the, um, the right to negotiate licensing deals with news aggregators so that they have to pay a fee to use that news content, the theory of change is, okay, if we um, allow or if we mandate that tech platforms pay a licensing fee, that will lead to more revenue um, for the media organizations, which will have a beneficial impact on news media sustainability because the platforms have re, um, you know, re revised the entire operating you know, you know, digital advertising ecosystem. Um, if you're looking at the theory of change around taxation and subsidies through taxes, it's a little bit different. It's like, I mean, a lot of the theory of change is well, these platforms are very wealthy, um, they're not paying their fair share of taxes already. Um, or if you're looking at through subsidies um, or through using subsidies through taxes, it's let's give news organizations a break on the tax it costs to send a newspaper or on the taxes that they pay in you know, whatever realm um, that, that you're thinking about there. And then with respect to competition and antitrust, the idea is, okay, theory of changes, the publishers are very disadvantaged they're so small compared to the platforms, and I say the platforms really at a, via Facebook and Google um, because those are the dominant platforms for news publishers uh, in terms of the publication and dissemination of news. Although there's also in terms of like the work product and ability to do journalism, um, and so looking at competition and antitrust to say, okay, well, how can we? empower news organizations to have more power with relation to um, the tech platforms which are seen as very powerful because you know not only are they among the wealthiest companies in the world but they also control the infrastructure on which journalism depends and so this analysis um, it starts first of all by doing an analysis of the ad tech system and what do we actually know about the link between revenue and traffic and one of the things that becomes very clear is we don't know enough to make good policies. And I think it's perfect to come after Frank, which when I mean, we're talking about different forms of data, but this paper is very important in terms of this broader conversation about what type of data we need to make good policy when it comes to technology regulation. And we just don't have either data from the platforms, which you know there are some efforts to rethink that but there's also the responsibility, I think, on the news media, which also have not collected, much less aggregated, a lot of this data or made it public. And I'd love to see, for example, a data collective, and there's some discussion around this now, 
you know, data collective where news organizations could share information about traffic so we can understand better the link between traffic and revenue. Because what we do know is that um, the, the two dominant platforms control both vertical and horizontal um, aspects of the ad tech infrastructure. And that a lot of that kind of the intermediaries in there are taking significant percentages of the advertising revenue. Um, that not all of it is getting to the publishers. And one foundational study found that over a third of the revenue couldn't even be accounted for. So also this idea of like auditing um, is really important when we think about this. But then you have to think about, okay, well, what is the risk of capture that's embedded in these different approaches? So if we're thinking about tax exemptions or direct subsidies by government, that raises the concern around government capture. So how do you define beneficiaries in a way that doesn't allow them to be defined by the government to, you know, pay, um, to, to favor one set of outlets over another or to punish outlets, et cetera. I mean, Anya has, Anya Schiffer and he's in the audience has done really foundational work in this issue of media capture and the use of government advertising and subsidies um, around the world. And that's a real concern, um, but it's also a good source of potentially stable income. So are there ways to design these interventions in a way that could, for example, define beneficiaries that take, that the further you move that power, that definitional power away from the government um, or any central actor, then that would reduce the potential for media capture. So for example, <clears throat> there are lots of press associations, professional journalism associations, trust initiatives, news integrity initiatives, et cetera, that identify news outlets. So is there a way that you could leverage some of these self-regulatory mechanisms to identify potential beneficiaries in a way that would let the industry itself decide rather than the government? That that help reduce some aspects of capture. Um, similarly, if you're thinking about like news media bargaining codes, which we're seeing in Australia, Canada, um, India, Indonesia, lots of, of um, countries are really interested in adopting an, an Australian-like law. Um, who gets to be in those news media bargaining codes? What counts as news media? How do you define that? Again, um, all of these questions which open up the potential for political interference. But then there's this broader question that I, that I wanted to understand, which is, how are these interventions that we're looking at or that regulators are considering, how does that further integrate the future and sustainability of journalism to the future and sustainability of platforms or to the logic of the economic, of the economics of platforms or the logic of visibility and content moderation um, on these platforms. So if you're saying, okay, uh, we want to allow news media to have more power in bargaining with platforms, and so we're gonna give them an antitrust exemption, for example. Well, that's great, but that means that solution is all about negotiating with platforms for more money, which depends on the financial sustainability of the platforms. It's all about that one relationship. And I think as we're seeing right now with tech platforms laying off thousands of workers, reducing budgets, et cetera, that becomes really precarious. Um, similarly, if you're looking at, okay, uh, we want to rethink intellectual property rights so that, you know, news aggregators have to publish or have to pay publishers. Well, that might, on the one hand, um, compel platforms to say, like, well, we're just not going to carry the news. Um, or if you, for example, Spain did mandate that you have, you, you actually can't opt out of that, um, then it still ties the, the future of the news to the platforms sending traffic their way, et cetera. And the challenge of that is that <coughs> if you further the integration of journalism into a handful of dominant platforms, they are captured by the economic logic, by the logic of visibility, the logic of engagement. So the rules that are set by those platforms, which are not necessarily the same rules or logic of journalism, in its ideal type, which is around the public interest. Um, so, you know, this paper basically looks at all these issues and urges regulators to consider 
how platform capture and other forms of capture are implicated in these approaches and to design them in a way that A, um, creates as much distance between political power and the decision about who benefits and how those benefits are allocated and definitions of beneficiaries, et cetera. And on the third, to think about how to design these regulations in a way that does not further tie the future of journalism to, uh, to these platforms so there can be more ability to evolve. That's up there. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so before I start, uh, let me say that uh, I am so happy uh, and grateful uh, to be here. So thank you for the invitation. I also really enjoyed the conversation since this morning, and I can insist that there is yet another day to go. So um, I'm going to try to, and, and thank you to Courtney and Frank. Uh, I had the privilege to skim through the paper yesterday, so uh, I was not, um, I, I knew what to expect, but still, that's. Uh, um, very interesting research. Also, the research I'm going to present here, which is uh, the the paper uh, that is going to be in, in the um, special issue, um, looks at a number of things that we've been discussing today already. Uh, but it does that from a slightly different perspective. Uh, so we've been focusing a lot on social media markets and the relationship between the very large online platforms, the social media and the news uh, publishers, the media outlet, etc., from a variety of perspectives. Uh, we've looked at uh, content moderation issues, the antitrust, etc., etc. Well, what I think is clear is that there are a number of market failures in there, and we can, you know, address them in different ways. We've been discussing network effects. We've been dis discussing high concentration, uh, the imbalance in between the bargaining power of the different actors. My research focused on a specific angle, which is the market failure in terms of diversity uh, or and a specific kind of diversity, which is the diversity of exposure to content of each user. So if it's true, as, is, uh, as it is true, uh, that uh, an increasing number of people, they access news and content through the social media, uh, then the point is uh, how this system impacts on the kind of diversity of content we are exposed to on a daily basis. Um, and I consider this, um, I consider this problem and uh, I tried to figure out which kind of ways we could go to in order to fix this challenge. Uh, through roughly speaking, and I'm very much oversimplifying here, two categories of intervention. One, which I consider a little bit more paternalistic, is to say, okay, we have a problem with diversity or serendipity of exposure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we could do, we could try regulatory interventions to establish a minimum amount of diversity that everybody needs to be exposed to. So you get into, you meaning the regulator or the government, gets into the market dynamics and says, this is the amount, the minimum amount we need to guarantee. There is another way, uh, which is a little bit less paternalistic and interventionist, if you think about it, um, although there is an issue of proportionality there as well, which is, um, so the amount of diversity I am exposed to is defined or decided by one, two, three algorithms maximum. So an idea could be to create a market condition for for uh, a number of a higher number of algorithms to flourish, so that I, as a user, I can pick my own algorithm based on certain criteria and be exposed to a different variety of content. So if we open up the market and we create this diversity, maybe we can get to the policy goal of increasing the diversity of exposure without mandating a diversity of content. So I consider the second option to be a little bit better for, um, uh, from a democratic perspective, from a free speech perspective, but still capable to achieve the, the media diversity goal. Um, and I, um, in previous research, I've sort of uh, tried to reason on um, how this sort of remedy could look like in practice. And then uh, after having a number of uh, theoretical conversations with people, and after seeing that so one of the components could be to say, okay, we need, some technical issues in the market. So we need a degree of interoperability so that developers of different algorithms that can come into the market and, uh, and users that can pick the different algorithm and plug it into the platform they're using. Um, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on this. Uh, and interoperability was, was an ease um, um, gaining traction in a number of regulatory initiatives, in a number of studies and reports, in a number of bills in the, U in the US. There are a couple of bills, at least that mention this. In Brazil, there are initiative uh, uh, proposals for, for new legislation, the DMA to a certain extent. So this is a widespread phenomenon. 
So rather than just uh, theoretically reasoning, I thought, okay, let's do a follow-up research. And what I've done, I've been discussing this with a number of stakeholders that would actually be uh, impacted if this kind of solution could uh, uh, could be implemented. Um, I've picked uh, so representative of large uh, online platforms. I've picked uh, content creators, so representative of media outlets, as well as uh, representative of uh, the category of influencers, if that is ever something possible, that they feel represented as a category. Um, I've also discussed this with people with a technical background, so programmers, to see, okay, this is possible, this is not possible, what I would need to develop these algorithms, what I would need to be able to make users capable of picking their own algorithm on Facebook or on Twitter, for example, um, and so on and so forth. And I've tried to keep a sort of a global uh, ambitious, yes, I know, and regulators, sorry, the other category was regulators, uh, media regulators and competition regulators. Um, I, I was ambitious enough to sort of think, okay, we don't need to be, I don't need to be Eurocentric in this research. I don't want to, and, and maybe to expand to the US is not enough. We need to figure out what other people think about it in market conditions that can be completely different. So I went to Australia, Myanmar, Canada, Brazil. So I tried to pick people from different areas. And it's interesting because the feedback were quite different. So the paper is very much about an analysis of those interviews, some structured interviews I've had with these people uh, about the possibility of implementing remedy. If the remedy in itself looks like this, uh, again, I'm more simplified. Um, if, um, uh, there could be the possibility for a regulator, the media or the competition regulator, depending on the scope and their mandate, uh, to sort of say, okay, if you're a, a, a dominant platform or a pl platform with significant market power, or however we want to call it, um, and you offer hosting and content creation. So you, I, I go on Facebook, I have my own profile, I have, upload all the materials I want, but then I'm also exposed to on the news feed to a variety of content, right? Those are two different services. They are offered as a bundle together now, but technically they can be separated. So one idea could be to say, okay, I need, to, as a regulator, we mandate to the dominant platform to separate those two, and we ob oblige to open up the market for the content creation. So if I'm Facebook, uh, I'm obliged to um, provide, you know, an open APA to programmers that want to you know, develop their own algorithm for content creation. And so as a user, I can decide to have my own page on Facebook, be like, like everybody else on that platform, but still plug my own preferred algorithm for content creation so that I know that this, you know, program or this algorithm is going to deliver it's going to expose me to content that is more sort of a, I like just sport and I don't want to be bothered by cat pictures. That's it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that was the remedy. And I've discussed this with all, all the stakeholders and it's interesting. So there've been a couple of uh, um, recurring issues that I've been discussing. And the first one is, uh, it's as basic as what's the goal and how do we frame this remedy? And you would say, okay, it's easy. It should be the same for everybody. But if you talk with a competition authority, they would say, yes, this is a good idea to sort of uh, lower the barriers to entry and open up a market and create competition. If you talk with a media regulator, they would say, this is a good idea to um, increase diversity of exposure in the market. If you talk with, uh, um, I don't know, uh, an intermediary, uh, so people that would actually offer content creation as a service, they would say, this is, this is a good way to create um, a space for a new service in the market because now we are sort of a, a squeezed in between. We are not necessarily able to offer the service. Um, if you talk with a user's representative, they would say uh, it's what would you say? They say <laughs> it's a way to empower us because we sort of feel that we have a little bit more of autonomy to decide which kind of criteria we want to be followed to select the content we are exposed to. Uh, so it goes as basic as you know the different goals, and that made me reason about the fact that maybe with one single instrument we can start thinking about achieving more than one goal, and uh, this might be a conversation that we want to have with different stakeholders at once. There is another point which has been raised again and again and again, which is okay, but what about the business model? What about the sustainability of this alternative business model? So Facebook, for example. Uh, I'm oversimplifying, right? Uh, so they track us online and they they uh, promote certain kind of content, content in order to keep us engaged because this is the way they make money. 
if I am a different algorithm developer, I want to expose you to diversity because I think it's a public good and I just want to do what's the right thing. How can I sustain my business? How, how, how can I, you know, where, where is the monetization part of it? Um, so the conversation has been um, different depending on the different stakeholders. And it has gone from saying, yeah, well, there is a point of saturation in the market. So even if we open up the market, you will see appearing like two or three more algori algorithms, but not a hundred. Um, there is there have been some people saying, but well, we're not convinced that users actually want this. Maybe users they don't want to have any autonomy on this. They are not um, interested in making you know having to 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 go through. A uh, number of clicks to define their own information diet every day because this is simply mm, something that you know they like the personalization that is made by Facebook and others and, and that's it. Um, but there have been uh, also conversations, mostly with regulators, I have to say, that said maybe this goes back to the ad tech. Maybe this needs to be solved in a more holistic way, and it's like you need to break the circle between keeping the attention and making money. Uh, if you don't go there at the core of it, then the sustainability of alternative business model is not going to be guaranteed. Um, there have been some civil society thinking, maybe we can go for public support because these algorithms will somehow, or at least some of them, achieve a public goal, then maybe we can think about public support for them. And so the conversation has gone on, uh, on sort of a thinking about what, what I call in those conversations, but I have no specific definition to provide here, some sort of public interest algorithms. So algorithms that can be optimized for something different from engagement, but you know, diversity, among other things, uh, diversity. Uh, and there, the conversation with technical uh, people, so the programmers has been super interesting because they said, okay, what do you mean by diversity? Diversity as a value is not the same as diversity of, as an output for an algorithm. So how we can, you know, talk to each other and get close and have a, a result that, that is, is um, satisfying for both of us. Uh, which kind of data do you need uh, for training this kind of algorithm? And then specifically, how we can promote it, how we can make sure that a sufficient critical mass of people, they will then <coughs> use it. They will be interested in this. So maybe we need some sort of a... Um, digital literacy, or maybe we need universities to use this on the first place, or uh, public service providers like the BBC or something. So to make citizens used to these kind of algorithms rather than just, you know, uh, because what we have seen as users for 20 years now is just those that have been provided by the main platform. So we're not used to this diversity. We're not used to this choice. Maybe we need to, to sort of a, go through a re-education uh, to our choice and freedom of choice. Um, the last point I want to raise, uh, although it's not by, it's by far not the last point that's been raised in these conversations, but I'm, I know that I'm in between the reception and, uh, <laughs> you know, a long day. Um, it's um, this conversation about user empowerment. So I was uh, uh, biased and quite convinced that it was uh, sort of an obvious component that if you give users a, a choice, it's a good thing. And eventually I was a little bit wrong. Or I, you know, it's not that every, uh, anybody proved me wrong, but they suggested I was wrong. Um, there are a number of stakeholders out there that are seriously convinced that people don't want this kind of autonomy. And then if we give them too much autonomy, then we're going to end up with a result that is much worse than what we have today. If we have this information today and hate speech and a number of our sort of our critical content, and I use brackets on purpose because I don't think we have an agreement of what the critical content, uh, let aside harmful content or something like this. Um, so if we give them more autonomy, then we're going to end up with much more of this kind of content than uh, quality content. Um, and. Um, <coughs> I strongly disagree about this. Uh, I have, uh, I'm a competition lawyer by background, and competition would mean nothing if you don't educate people to the freedom of ch to choose. So, you know, by background, I, I have a different approach. But even if um, by giving autonomy and choice to people, rather than just triggering quality and innovation, we would create or open the door to more problems of, of this sort, then I don't think the problem is a regulatory problem, but it is a human being problem. So it needs to be addressed somewhere else, I think. Um, okay, with this not really positive note, I don't have <laughs> <laughs> Take one minute to just sort of
react to that? Absolutely. Because I, 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 I want to draw a through line between our two papers and some of the research that I heard about earlier in some of the discussions. So what I loved about, like a lot of the ideas, but I, I most love the concept of like, is there a role for public financing of public interest algorithms, right? Which sort of connects up directly with our research and with some of the stuff I heard in, in our last breakout, which is, I think it's going to be very controversial and for all kinds of reasons problematic to have direct government subsidization of the creation of content in newsrooms, right? You can only just look at the National Endowment for the Arts example, right? I mean, the moment that somebody does a controversial piece of artwork, then there's this collective societal freak out that we should take all government money away from all artists because we paid three thousand dollars to somebody to do a blasphemous sculpture, right? And so, like, we already know where that road leads because we've been down it before. But there are all kind of interesting tertiary ways that government could be kind of propping up journalism by helping to build a healthier infrastructure around it, and this idea of kind of publicly subsidized algorithms and sort of thinking about you know those could be housed at libraries which is something we talked about in the last breakout right that like training public librarians to be kind of sherpas to guide people to high quality news sites to explain to them what makes news high quality and how anonymous sourcing works and some of the other things we talked about in the last panel that would be like a huge boost to the news industry without actually putting money into the pockets of individual journalists based on some governmental assessment of whether their news is high quality or not, just as I think ours, right, pushing out data in such a way that you save these news organizations the money, the time, the manpower of fighting to dislodge this information that they've been now charged exorbitant amounts in the past to, 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 to release, right, that would be an indirect subsidy to the news business that I think like would be completely uncontroversial and widely publicly supported and much less likely to be kind of philosophically and ideologically gained. So um, I just think that's a, an, an interesting way of broadening out the conversation about public support for news. Like, is there a secondary and tertiary way to do it that doesn't involve actually going down the national endowment for the arts model, but, but, but to build a healthier infrastructure in which news organizations can thrive? Thank you. Um, another kind of connection between your uh, three papers is they all discuss um, regulatory solutions and other solutions. So I was wondering if you could um, maybe kind of expand on some of the trade-offs of those solutions and particularly discuss how some of the potentially negative consequences. Anyone wants to take that? I think all the papers discuss. Yeah, well, uh, uh, very, very briefly, this is something that I've, I've discussed in, in the interviews as well. And uh, I have to say, a number of regulators have felt a little bit uncomfortable because they said, okay, we open up the market, but then um, if, if, if rather than one algorithm setting your, your uh, information diet, so suggesting, you know, uh, sort of like tracking what, what, what you're doing online, what your preferences, and then serving you content. If you have 10 of those algorithms, then there's going to be some sort of data sharing in between the different uh, algorithm provider. Uh, so you have more provider of services, more, more people, more uh, actors are going to have access to your data. And, uh, and also there have been discussions like if I am the platform, I am Twitter or YouTube or I am Facebook, and I open up and I allow everybody to come in and plug their own algorithm, how can I ensure that uh, users are secure? Um, so this kind of conversation always happen when you promote interoperability. It's like, okay, interoperability, but then how can we deal with privacy issues, security issues? To a certain extent, some of these uh, sort of uh, uh, worries are justified. Uh, but my impression, and I'm happy to elaborate on details uh, if we have time, is that the majority of the time they're actually instrumentalized though. Uh, because there are some safeguards that can be put in place. And also because, um, uh, you know, uh, there are so many different kinds of interoperability we can discuss on. And we don't need to go to the most pervasive from scratch. So we can build on this. And we can also rely on different standards that um, can have a different role. Like there can be some sort of safe harbor. If you implement this interoperability standard as a big platform, then you're supposed to be compliant with this rule. 
and then everybody knows uh, the kind of incompatibility we're dealing with and so security and privacy issue can be dealt while setting the standard. There is also another trade-off which has been mentioned again and again and again in this conversation which is okay my um, point, focal point of attention was what I called in, in, a, in a very uh, quick way, I apologize for this, content creation. So content creation, by content creation, I, uh, um, I refer to all this, the different actions that the platform uh, take uh, to promote, demote, rank content, etc. So I tend to, uh, I, um, I tend to consider content creation as that big box of activities uh, that complements what we call generally content moderation. So it's not about legal or illegal content, and it's not about uh, deleting some content or suspending some accounts, but it's all the rest of activities that, that goes on there. Um, and so one of the trade-offs uh, was, okay, but you do have other algorithms that deal with the content creation, but what do we do with content moderation? Because uh, Facebook would say, wait, because I don't gain any money from content creation, uh, from content moderation, sorry, it's just a cost for me. Uh, so if I need to open up the door to others to take, you know, uh, to, to perform the part of the business that may, that, that helps me to make money, which is the creation of content, and I still remain with the content moderation nobody wants to do because it's just a cost and, and creates a lot of problem. We have an imbalance there. So if I need to open up my IPA, I want these people to do content moderation too. And then the point is, um, to what extent a small startup is able to do content moderation <coughs> in a way uh, that big platforms can do? Do they have the economic resources? Do they have the people? Do they have the incentives? Do they have the capacity? <coughs> uh, so this might be another trade-off. Um, I don't have a major solution. I still believe that we need to keep those two things separated, the content moderation and the content moderation. <coughs> And that there could be so many uh, different ways to address both, whether they just either you do that together and you're a big platforms or you do not, and you're or you're incapable to do any of them. Uh, so yeah, just to say, those are the kind of trade-offs. Um, my take would be uh, everybody's super nice to be able to sort of uh, implement these uh, remedies uh, into a sort of a pilot or a regulatory sandbox and see in practice. Uh, what could be the real trade-off uh, and how to, to learn how to possibly address them. Uh, because it seems to me that sometimes we spend years in discussing things, but we don't test them in practice. And so it's difficult to learn from uh, you know, uh, mistakes if we don't do mistakes. You know? <laughs> One of the things that um, I focus on a lot in my paper is information asymmetries. <clears throat> and so some of the regulatory interventions propose to better address those asymmetries in different ways. So the news media bargaining code in Australia, for example, includes a provision on algorithmic transparency. Although realistically, it's not really algorithmic transparency, it's really about policy changes like you know, favoring video or switching to favoring you know, friend, content from friends over um, others. So I, I think it's kind of a misnomer, but um, like like um, you say here, I also spoke with journalists around the world, and that is one of the biggest things that they want is this algorithmic transparency, um, which sounds great in terms of policy transparency so they can understand, you know, if there's going to be a big change, how do they adapt to make sure that the visibility of their content will be affected um, or that they can adapt accordingly, because we know from previous, um, you know, the previous several years that, that when the platforms make major changes it has an impact on media viability but then if you have it was very interesting you know thesis proposal what would that mean if you all of a sudden have interoperable like a huge choice of algorithms what would that do to algorithmic transparency requirements in news media bargaining code if all of a sudden you could like plug and play algorithms that would kind of i think introduce a really a big challenge to some of these um, approaches. The other thing, you know, a, another approach that has been um, put forward is to treat some of the platforms like specifically Google and Facebook as common carriers or public utilities or some sort of uh, public interest domain where it needs to be regulated in a different way. And um, there are proposals, for example, to then 
create like a tax or create a super fund to clean up um, the, you know, the, the crud online, kind of the same way that we clean up the environment with the super fund, um, which sounds, you know, I think great on the one hand, but I think that comes with a lot of potential risks if you think about platform structure, <coughs> because it does further embed those particular platforms and their business design, their engagement design, which as Jen said earlier, their advertising agencies, you know, we know that they um, are fueled through engagement, extremism does really well. So that could be a really negative if we, for, you know, on the, it sounds great, like, okay, well, let's make sure they treat everything equally, the content, you know, can flow easily, news media doesn't get, you know, over moderated, but then what does that do in terms of creating the, the logic of visibility and amplification on the platforms and then creating that as a guiding light there. So I think that's something to be thought of um, as well. And then in terms of like some of the tax, the, this idea of like taxing there. So we talk about, you know, taxing digital advertising, but there are also, you can tax different layers of the ad, ad tech stack. So you could also think about taxing the infrastructure layer. Um, you could tax the ISPs, for example, um, because they, you know, people are using the internet to access news and then divert some of the, that revenue. But I think then there's always a trade-off and always that decision about who benefits, how do you de define journalism? Uh, there, you know, the, the Australian code, good for them for like getting out there first and doing it. Um, but they came under a lot of criticism because they didn't distinguish what type of journalistic outlets or media outlets should benefit. And so it was perceived as, you know, something that really benefited Murdoch and, you know, his, his media empire was very involved in lobbying for this. And that, ha that killed the bill in Brazil. It was part of a much broader, very problematic bill. Um, but, you know, the, the platforms were able to really work with small media to get them up in arms about the idea that, oh, these, you know, wealthy, big news organizations that are doing much better than you are going to benefit and it becomes this um, trade off between, you know, supporting big media who don't need it as much or are seen as already oligarchic um, versus small media. You see this in Canada coming up and so you see, okay, how are we defining beneficiaries? What I said when I talked to one of the Senate offices working on the, um, the US version, the JCPA, um, the Journalist, of, Journalist Conservation and Preservation Act, is like, honestly, it's probably not going to save journalism, like letting them bargain collectively. I think it's not going to have a big impact on journalism sustainability, but also is it going to have a huge detrimental impact? Probably not. And I think, you know, to the point that Maria just made, we need to like make some, we need to see what happens. We need to take some interventions, <clears throat> collect the data, um, both from the media side and the platform side, and see what the impacts are so that we can then make better policies. But I definitely think it's worth implementing some of these. And it's really interesting when you look at, you know, Canada and having how they define local news. You have to have some Canadian, you know, ownership um, in the news. So, so really, like when you these different laws, you also see that there is some kind of general consensus around what type of news organizations should benefit. And so I think we could do more on that comparison, but you are going to have this trade off where if big media is seen as benefiting, that could then split the media community, which can make it harder then to pass any legislation, which is also what we saw happen, as I mentioned, in Brazil, but also in the US. So you know, there's a lot of dynamics going on there. Um, I would want to build on the point that both um, Courtney and uh, Maria made about uh, just starting off with a proposal and getting it through the door and trying how it works. Um, one of the points you make in your paper, Frank, is how there was so much support behind um, the open data movement. Uh, and your research shows that it hasn't all panned out it, um, exactly how we might have hoped. So I'm wondering what you think some of the lessons from that might be towards some of these other proposals that we're considering. Yeah, thanks. And, and that's absolutely right. I mean, one of the magazines that does a lot of work in this space, um, Government Technology, did a really comprehensive survey last year looking at um, 
data sets at various state and local government um, open data sites around the country. They look at 55,000 of these data sets. Right? It's a very comprehensive look at it. And what they found is that out of those 55,000 data sets that they studied, 90% of them had been clicked on 2,200 times or less over the course of their entire life, right? And so when you think about that level of utilization, I mean, if you had a, a news site that over the course of its lifespan attracted only 2,200 people, you'd go out of business, right? And that, that's, a, that's a fail. And, and, you know, we're talking about this includes like really big cities, right? And you imagine, you know, a data set that, you know, is, is in New York or LA or Chicago that like fewer than 2,000 people are interested in looking at, right? I mean, that, that's a fail. Um, and, and, and the vast majority of that fall into that category. So like one of the things that is clear is there's sort of a mismatch between what people in government think is interesting and what you and I think is interesting. Um, um, and so I, I, a lot of that really does go back to that there hasn't been a mandate to either count things in a reliable way or to publish it in any kind of a consistent way. There's only 16 states that have statutes that actually impose any mandate on state and local government agencies to publish open data. And so the vast majority of states were on the honor system, right? It's just, you know, voluntary. And when you have things that are voluntary, they're never the highest priority. And so understandably, right, you've got a problem of prioritization. You've got a problem of many local government organizations see this as sort of an unfunded mandate. Right? Like, well, thanks a lot for telling us that we should, you know, in those 16 states, thanks a lot for telling us that we should publish our data. Where is our grant money to hire the technologists to be able to do this, right? So um, I think there's um, a lot of takeaways from this in terms of like what a successful kind of national commitment to open data would look like and has to start with some combination of, because frankly, right, all of the incentives are very lopsided in favor of Concealment, right? I mean, if you're a government agency, the, 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 the incentives are, are very much aligned, just like in any organization, right? Power, um, um, monopolization of information is power, right? The person who controls the information is powerful. And, and lots of powerful people have trouble sharing information because that means that they're seeking power, right? You can check up on me. You can see, well, is my program really working as advertised, right? Well, if I don't tell you the information, then you can just take my word for it. Right? And so, of course, all of the incentives are very value-aligned in favor of secrecy and concealment, and so you really have to require it, right? make it mandatory. And you know, one of the sort of double whammy things, that going back to our point about the small communities where they don't seem reliable to publish any high-value data sets at all, is that imagine you live in a small town in Oklahoma or Nebraska with a barely functional open data site, you're also really unlikely to have a well-functioning newspaper anymore, right? Because all of those newspapers are closed or hollowed out by layoffs. And so here you are, right? You're, you're both reliant on a newspaper that maybe has one or two reporters left in the newsroom, and you're also at the mercy of the city government that has decided that for whatever reason, like you really want to see the, you know, the database of uh, pet licenses and not the database of police brutality. Um, and so uh, I really got to make this um, a, a consistent requirement, but both a stick and a carrot, right? That there are penalties for, for not doing it, but also that there is some money to help out the, the Norman Oklahomans of the world by hiring people uh, with, with data science expertise. Can I ask a question though? Because I mean, maybe only 2,200 people have used it, but if those are fake journalists who then write about something that leads to, you know, revealing, uh, there was a big story about, you know, nail parlors and New York and like most people probably do not care about the data but then they found out what that journalist had discovered by looking at the data so I would push back a little bit on the idea that we should look at raw numbers because I think that could end up in, in impeding a lot of the, the journalism right it, it's a really good point and one of the points that other researchers have made and that we try to build on is that maybe the approach ought not to be one size fits all because you have at least three discrete audiences here. So when you're talking about prioritization, right, it's very hard to prioritize for the audience of number one, general public, number two, journalists, and number three, researchers, right? And so like we give an example of um, it for, for a, an average member of the public, um, a data set about like which bus routes are habitually the most delayed, right, habitually the most late. 
might not be that useful because if I uh, take the bus from my house to work, I take the same one all the time, right? It's not like, oh, I could find a bus route on the other side of town that's more prompt. Well, big deal, I don't want to go there, right? But for researchers, that might be really useful, right? To figure out, oh, well, you know, there's some problem with traffic patterns here. You know, maybe we need to route these things differently. Um, maybe this route isn't even, you know, uh, uh, useful anymore. I, I, I mean, we should eliminate it and put in a higher value one, right? And so, yeah, I, I think there's a real um, case to be made that, again, with the proper amount of investment and prioritization, that these sites could be made much more useful by having sort of tiers, right, of here's the public-facing part that addresses the things that we think the public is most interested in, you know, where to pick up the bus, here's the things that we think researchers and journalists might be the most interested in. Thing. And again, you could really use FOIA requests as a proxy for that, right? Because not only in, in you know, journalists, right, are by far not the biggest users of FOIA, right? Like law firms, environmentalists, and consumer groups, advocates of various kinds are much, much, much more avid users of FOIA. So FOIA usage is actually like a pretty good proxy for what, you know, kind of super users of information are interested in. And so you could really use that as a go behind for um, what do we need to push out first? Okay, uh, thank you. I think we're getting a little tight on time, so I think um, we can go ahead and open it up to, to questions. Okay. Um, just a quick time to you folks. This is very complex material. Each of you has covered very different slices of it. Um, Frank, your idea is just great, and just the, I think, driving down the cost of investigative reporting. Happens.